Chapter 401 Battle Against the Manticles The elite-level manticle howled out in pain. Violent elementium flames ravaged its body, burning and roasting its flesh. All the hair on its skin vanished in an instant. Boils of all sizes rose on the exposed areas, exploding and sending blood splashing all over the place. The elite manticore frantically retreated into the cave and deep into the smoke. No one could see the creature, but they still heard its pained cries and howls. It had been severely injured. Truly, severely injured. That blow might not have been lethal, but it had been excruciating. That elite manticore was not going to rejoin the battle any time soon. The roaring monster took this small window of opportunity to absorb as much earth elementium from the ground as possible. It then compressed the elementium and formed it into tough rocks to repair the damage done to its body. Meanwhile, Grim launched a few more magma fireballs at the ground. He set the entire entry on fire and bought a little more time for the roaring monster to recover. However, the next wave of attacks from the enemy quickly descended upon them. The manticles no longer attempted a self-harming charge with their bodies. Instead, two adolescent manticles flapped their wings, blew away the fires on the ground, and approached the roaring monster by climbing across the stone wall. The limited space in the tunnel made it impossible for them to use their large movements and attacks. Still, their sharp claws and piercing fangs remained a threat to the monster. On the other hand, the manticles had no space to dodge the attacks coming from Grim and the Decayer. They endured all the blows with their defensive force fields and tenacious physique. Every time the roaring monster managed to repair its stone armor, it would instantly be shredded and torn apart by the vicious attacks of the manticles. The monster's stone body had been severely damaged. There were wide cracks and piercing claw marks all over the front of its body. The elementium core used to create the roaring monster was still of slightly inferior quality. It was at an absolute disadvantage against these manticles that were just as strong and resilient as it was. The roaring monster still endured thanks to its powerful crowd control ability. Every so often, it was able to launch its trembling earth and disrupt the rhythm of the manticles. This bought it some time during the fight to regenerate. Its stone armor also increased the golem's defense tremendously. Without these abilities, it would not have lasted this long against the manticles. If it had been the decayer in its position instead, the fight would have ended in a matter of a few minutes. Despite all its abilities, the roaring monster was at its limits. The two manticles retreated from the battle having sustained wounds all over their bodies. Two fresh manticles promptly took their place and started attacking the monster. The rocks it had gathered around its body shattered, while its stone armor and body were shredded and in tatters. Soon its core would be exposed. It would be difficult to keep the enemy contained within the cave once they destroyed the monster. Grim had no choice but to have the roaring monster retreat and regenerate its body. The fire adept strode forward to stop the manticles, his body swelling in size with every step. Grim had activated his flame fiend transformation without hesitation. However, he had yet to unseal the flame fiend's heart. The appearance of the powerful flame fiend was torturous to the two manticles crowding the choke point. Grim might not have the same strength and physique of the roaring monster, even after his transformation but he did possess plenty of defensive magic to spare. The flames from his own body were a protection of sorts. Anyone that sought to attack him took fire damage when they came into contact with his body. Apart from that, there was also the magma shields, the energy shields from the iron stones, and the burning ring of fire. Even a man made of stone would be baked into clay if he stood before green. What were manticles of flesh and blood before such overwhelming might? The two manticles recklessly struck at the magma shields, gritting their teeth and enduring the barrage of magma fireballs as they did so. Their flesh had been scalded and burned. The flames, lava, and streams of fire all came together like a giant oven, roasting and cooking them inside and out. 
The two manticores fled the battlefield as fast as they could once they had broken through Green's magma shields and scratched his massive body a couple of times. The one to replace them was an intimidating manticore far larger than any one of them. An overbearing killing intent pressed against Green's face. Even with all the might of his transformation, he felt a chill in his heart. Green's burning passion for fighting extinguished quickly. The manticore leader. An elite male manticore. Green didn't dare hold anything back when dealing with such a strong being. The fires on the outside of his body started to roil and surge around chaotically. The flame fiend's heart began to beat at a wild rhythm as wave after wave of pure fire energy coursed through his veins to every part of his body. The flames on Green's body turned from crimson red to dark purple. Evil and twisted power of the utmost purity surged forth alongside the abyssal fires. This fire could destroy the soul even as it burned the flesh away. It was a wicked and sinister strength. The manticore leader stood proudly in the sea of flames. Its powerful life force field distorted the space around its body, preventing it from being harmed by the fire. Its magnificent and regal eyes trained on green. There was deep hatred in them, but there was also something more. Confusion and incomprehension, and even more than that, the light of wisdom unique to intelligent life. Human, why do you invade our home? We have never hunted or killed any adepts. Your land. Green did not put on an adept's air of arrogance when faced with an enemy of equal power. He gave the answer the manticore sought, I need this land. I need the volcanic energies in the depths of this underground cavern. The light in the manticore's eyes flickered. He immediately knew that today's matter was not going to end well. As underground creatures, manticores couldn't divorce themselves from the unique environment here. Further down in the underground abyss they would only find more dangerous magical creatures to contest them. Many were creatures they didn't even dare to cross. If they went to the surface, they would lose to the magical creatures there. They had neither the power nor the rate of reproduction to contest with those monsters. In the end, only the uppermost levels of the underground world suited the manticores. If they left this familiar land behind, they would fall from the middle ranks to the lower levels of the Black Forest's food chain. It wouldn't be them going out to hunt others. Instead, it would be their turn to run and hide from the pursuit of their predators. The significance of this den to the manticore pack was clear and distinct. The only way to have them surrender the land would be to step over their cold corpses. The manticore leader no longer entertained any thoughts of negotiation once he understood their position. With a furious roar, he leaped at the massive flame fiend. Grim lunged at the manticore with equal vigor and energy. However, he had already swallowed a potion before he stepped forward. It was the antidote that Gargamel had specially concocted to deal with the manticore's paralyzing venom. Grim pushed forward with both of his hands before he clashed with the manticore leader. A massive torrent of fire blasted towards the beast. The manticore took the flames head-on with its powerful force field, parting the flames and charged at Green. Scritch. 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 Frightening claws left deep marks on the magma shields floating in front of Green. The fire singed the magnificent hair on the manticore leader's chest and instantly burned away. His long scorpion tail abruptly struck at the flame fiend as the two held each other at bay. The hook-shaped stinger had some kind of armor-penetrating effect. It immediately broke through the magma shield and embedded itself in the body of the flame fiend. Ah! Aoooooo! The two opponents let out screams of agony at the same time. Green felt his shoulder hurt and slowly become numb. By the end of it, he couldn't feel anything from his shoulder. The manticore leader's potent paralyzing venom also possessed the ability to cripple the soul. Green felt himself losing control over parts of his body. It was a slight and insignificant loss of control, but it did indeed exist. The manticore, on the other hand, 
howled from the fire damage he took from his burnt stinger. He felt like he had just thrust his tail into molten magma. There were plenty of spirit nodes located in his tail, and it felt like his tail had been completely cooked in a flash. Even though he was already injecting as much venom as he could into his enemy, it didn't appear to have much effect. While most prey would have collapsed entirely, it only seemed to have slightly hindered and slowed the movement of this adept. Meanwhile, the ring of fire and the sea of magma beneath his feet were burning him. Even the manticore leader could not endure such monumental fire damage. After a dozen more seconds striking at each other, the manticore leader was the first to back away. The tremendous damage that both of them had suffered in the short skirmish was only noticeable now that they had separated from each other. All the magma shields that Grim had around him had shattered and a gaping wound had been torn in his chest. Crimson lava continuously flowed from the hole, transforming the ground into a small magma lake. While he was the flame fiend, all this lava was his blood. The manticore hadn't fared much better either. It was almost as if he had been thrown into a volcano for a lava bath. Not a single piece of his skin was unharmed by the flames and lava. Every inch of skin had been burned and damaged, boils and blisters covered his entire body. The blood that flowed from his wounds turned to vapor before it could drip to the ground. If it weren't because his eleven points of physique granted him the innate ability of rapid regeneration, he would have had to retire from this battle. The manticore leader put some distance between the two of them. He intended to catch a breath before launching an even more ferocious wave of attacks. On the other hand, Grim didn't even take a step backward. Instead, he gestured and grabbed the scroll of voodoo in his hands. The fire adept wanted to launch another wave of spells at the manticore without any pause. Scarlet Firestorm Firecore Explosion Two destructive fire spells instantly locked onto the opponent and devoured the enemy like an unstoppable storm. Chapter 402 Recruitment If Grim's fire spells were what hurt the manticores the most, then Gargamel's poison mist potions were what exterminated any hopes of survival the beasts might have had. The battle today would have taken far more time if it wasn't for Gargamel. Gargamel was able to keep the manticores contained in the cave but he had no means by which to kill them. In truth, the overall strength of the manticore pack was at least two or three times more than Grim and his party. However, there was no if in this world. The logical combat strategy, combined with the appropriate men, along with a perfect execution allowed this victory of the few over the many. Even with the might of their powerful bodies and fearless wills, the adolescent manticores failed to blow away the boulder in their path. That was when their tragic fates were sealed. The manticore leader retreated deep into the depths of the cave. Two teenage manticores took his place instead. The strongest manticores had already withdrawn due to their injuries. They had no choice but to send the slightly weaker ones to try and break through the siege. However, the ones they faced were true monsters there was the wholly repaired roaring monster and the fierce fire adept. A meat shield and a force of pure destruction. Add to the equation the decaya and Gargamel, and there was no way the teenage manticores could succeed. They were hit and wounded by a chain of spells before they even reached the roaring monster. Even when they finally arrived in front of the stone giant, a single trembling earth sent them packing. Then, it was yet another storm of spells pelting against their hides. The two teenage manticores collapsed almost immediately. They would have died right there in the tunnel if the manticores behind them hadn't dragged them by their tails and brought their unconscious bodies back into the cave. It was now that the full extent of Gargamel's sinister plan revealed itself. If it weren't for the poison mist, the manticores would have had plenty of other options. At the very worst, they would have been able to defend their position and turn the fight into a protracted one with the adepts. However, Gargamel's existence made that impossible. Suffocating poison mist filled the entire cave, leaving the manticores with no other choice but to recklessly throw their bodies against the onslaught. 
Of course, the manticore leader could have had a better chance at breaking through if he had been a little more sly. For example, Sending the teenage manticles to fight while they were still at their peak would have worn away at the roaring monster and Grimm's strength. Then they could have sent the elite manticles to hack at them relentlessly. It would probably have increased their chances of breaking through. After all, the adepts barely had any meat shields on their side. There was only the roaring monster and the somewhat underqualified Grimm. The situation would ultimately have turned against the adepts the moment the roaring monster was destroyed. There would be no turning the tides then. After all, Grim could not compare to his past self. Having lost the infernal tyrant, Grim's strength was barely at the level of a veteran adept. If he unsealed the flame fiend's heart, he would temporarily possess the explosive power of an elite adept. Unfortunately, that only lasted for a mere 15 minutes. With only that level of power, it was extremely believable that the elite-level magical creatures would defeat him. In the end, he still managed to pull off this plan that he had simulated with the use of the chip. Many things happened in the process, but they had managed to take down these manticles without much risk. Eleven manticles, yet not one of them had been blown to bits by Grimm's violent spells. Instead, all eleven of them had collapsed to Gargamel's poison, they were sprawled all across the cave, weakened and exhausted. Even the wounded elite manticore leader was no exception. All the hair on his body had fallen out. Blisters covered his skin, and sour pus trickled down his body. Even Grim couldn't help but feel some slight lamentations when he dispersed the mist and set eyes on this scene. Such a powerful manticore family yet they were still taken down by a few adepts. It was so bizarre that it was almost unbelievable. However, Grim's sympathy only lasted for a short moment as he looked at the crippled manticles. He then raised his voice and gave an order to Gargamel, hurry up and save them. We must not let them die, or we will be losing way too much. There was no need for Grim's reminder. Gargamel was already on the task. He dove into the cave and laughed without reservation when he saw the collapsed manticles. His sharp, owl-like voice was chilling to hear. Quick. Quick, quick, Gargamel gave a series of commands, give them the antidotes and tie them up. The mercenaries that hadn't been able to help in the previous fight now rushed into the cave. They held a piece of wet cloth drenched in some sort of potion over their mouths. With their help, all eleven of the manticles were quickly restrained with ropes and fed the antidotes. Gargamel was not kind enough to completely remove the toxin in their bodies. If the poison hadn't weakened the manticles, then they could have easily broken free of these iron thread vine ropes with their natural strength. Thus, the antidotes that Gargamel fed them were modified remedies. It took away the lethal effects of the poison but kept the manticles in a weakened state. The medicines also caused the toxins to seep into their lungs to make it easier to force the beasts into submission. A family of manticore like this one was most suited to be recruited as the future guards of the Adept's Tower. Grim left the task of drafting the manticles to Gargamel, while he went deeper underground. There, he found a massive cavern and a lava well. Grim sensed the dense fire elementum aura the moment he stepped into this place. The entire network of caves spanned one full kilometer. A glowing red light enveloped it. The suffocating smell of sulfur was thick in the air. And the source of all this was the lava well in the center of the cavern. A fiery well five meters in diameter. It was a lava well that went straight down into the depths of the ground. Looking down from above, Grim saw roiling magma everywhere. The well was approximately 50 meters away from the surface of the lava sea. The walls around the lava were all volcanic rocks that could endure the unbearable heat of the molten rocks. These volcanic rocks were the perfect materials with which to construct a fire adept's tower. Grim gripped his staff and decisively leaped into the sea of lava. The partial immunity brought about by his body of flames allowed him to explore the surface of the sea of lava. 
the fire adept was promptly shocked. This place was a natural lung of the earth. Much like humans need lungs to breathe, the world underground required passages by which energy could flow to and from the surface world. Volcanoes were one such formation. However, most of the other lungs of the earth existed in such a fashion, like the one in front of Green. They were hidden all over the continent, sometimes even found at the bottom of the boundless sea. These lungs dispersed the heat underground to the surface with the use of winding passages, then absorbed the ubiquitous elementium energy back into the depths of the underground. And here was a natural lung of the earth that contained mostly fire elementium. Its existence was immensely valuable to a fire adept like himself. Green left a magical emblem near the lava well to serve as a coordinate marker. It was only then that he returned to the manticore den satisfied. Gargamel experienced a significant breakthrough in the three days Green had left on his adventure. The two manticore cubs were the first to crumble before the threat of death and poison. They lowered their heads in humiliation, opening their souls and allowing Gargamel to place a soul mark inside them. With the threat of the poison and the implantation of his soul mark, these two manticore cubs were entirely under Gargamel's control. A single word and they would kill themselves if that were Gargamel's wish. The other manticores soon surrendered after that. They were then freed. Only the two elite manticores refused to submit, even with the threat of death hanging above their heads. This undoubtedly exasperated Gargamel. However, after Green returned, he went to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the manticore leader and finally managed to have the beast submit. Two factors caused him to surrender. First, Green promised that this would be a contract of service rather than a contract of servitude. That meant that Green would have to pay the Manticore family from now on. This amount was temporarily determined to be 30 magical crystals. Second, the descendants of the Manticores would be free beasts. Any cubs born from now on were not to be bound by contract and were free to live, spawn, and migrate as they wish. The adepts would not be allowed to interfere. Green happily agreed to these two points. It was only then that the Manticore leader joined his faction along with his mate. Having dealt with the Manticore issue, Green left Gargamel, Sabrina, and Daniel in Plaguewood and led the mercenaries back to Pinecone Town. Eva, on the other hand, was hiding somewhere obscure. The mercenaries had never met her, and naturally didn't know of her existence. This trip into the Black Forest had taken a total of 27 days from start to finish. All of Pinecone Town was astonished when they successfully returned unharmed. The mercenaries that stayed in the town rushed to the inn to listen to Love and the others talk about their adventure. However, all members of the party that Green had hired kept their mouths shut. They didn't dare leak even a single detail about their employer. Green only stayed in Pinecone Town for a single night. He hurried back to his clan on the second day. The first thing he did upon returning was to pay a visit to Lady Sanazar. He then submitted his request to construct his personal adept's tower. This construction was something great adept Lord Sarubo had personally promised him after the conclusion of the last planar war. As such, he was extraordinarily straightforward and confident about his request. Lady Sanazar seemed to be in a good mood. She happily agreed to Green's request and left the task to second grade Adept Fugan. Green asked around after the meeting and found out the reason for Lady Sanazar's joyful spirits, the clan's ambassador in the Northern Lands had finally managed to establish contact with Alice. The two clans had established an extremely beneficial negotiation. It wasn't hard to imagine Sanazar's joy at the situation. Chapter 403 Personal Adepts Tower The Witches of Fate didn't have enough manpower to maintain and manage all the territory that the witch branches had returned to them. Thus, when the Sarubo clan finally established contact with her, Alice happily gave away plenty of the spare resources she had on hand. The Sarubo clan would use their human resources to help the Witch of Fate to operate and manage these territories and resource sites. 
all they had to do was hand over some of the resources that they collected every so often. This collaboration was immensely beneficial for both the Sarubo clan and Alice. While the resource sites and lands that the witch branches returned to Alice were the most insignificant portions of what they owned, it was still a massive amount of resources, especially in the eyes of a mid-sized adept clan. It was even somewhat questionable whether they would be able to manage so many assets at once properly. The Sarubo clan had no choice but to come to agreements with the local clans to start the development of these assets as soon as possible. Even so, they were barely maintaining operations across the board. The Sarubo clan needed these lands and resource sites to expand their relations and trade in the northern lands, while Alice needed a pre-existing source of labor to help her manage the massive, sprawling assets of the Witches of Fate. Naturally, the two fit together like pieces of a puzzle and were quickly discussing the next stage of their collaboration. For the past few days, Sanazar had been busy communicating with their ambassador in the Northern Lands. They were laying out the specifics of the agreement with the Witches of Fate as well as figuring out the assignment of manpower over the various assets. Alice was practically alone as a witch leader. She barely had two or three subordinates around her that could help with her work, and none of them were people she could entirely trust. This amount of power was not even sufficient for her to establish a small clan in the Gentrim area. Still, a witch leader was a witch leader. The rights bestowed upon Alice by the ancient rules meant that she was entitled to resources and lands that were enough to put to shame even ancient clans with legacies spanning tens of thousands of years. Of course, that was in future. That was why the Sarubo clan had much to gain if they were able to establish a friendly relationship with her. It was these factors that caused Sanazar to view Grim in an extremely favorable light. Those who were not privy to the situation might think that Grim and Alice were only involved in an exchange of interests. Sanazar, having associated with both of them, knew better. Their relationship was definitely something more profound. In fact, the dynamic and nature of their relationship was likely the exact opposite of everyone else's expectations. Sanazar couldn't make things difficult given these circumstances. She didn't want to ruin their close working relationship with the Witches of Fate. Not to mention, there was no real reason to deny Green's request. According to their promise, the Sarubo clan was responsible for helping Green construct an adept's tower in a suitable location. Based on Green's understanding, even the lowest tier 3 level tower would cost a minimum of 200,000 magical crystals. This cost didn't even include all the facilities that a proper adept's tower needed. When Green entered Sir Fugan's room, the second grade adept quickly activated a long distance communication crystal. A short moment later, the crystal projected a middle-aged adept in elegant attire. Welcome to the Silver Union's Divini Trade Company. Architect Hani is at your service. May I know how I may be of service, Sir Fugan? Adept Hani, this is Adept Grim of our Sarubo clan. He needs to construct a personal adept's tower. All the cost incurred will be shouldered by the clan. As for the model, Use the most basic and common one. I'll leave the specifics for the two of you to discuss on your own. Having said that, Fugan stepped away and left Grim alone in front of the screen of light. Congratulations, Adept Grim! Adept Hani sincerely exclaimed. Thank you. Grim nodded his head and acknowledged the compliment. Usually, the clan only constructed an adept's tower at major clan territories and resource sites. That was to increase their control over the region and to make it easier to manage and rule. Constructing personal towers for individual adepts was a substantial privilege only reserved for the few core adepts of the clan. While this tower was only a fundamental tower of the lowest tier, Green still possessed complete authority over the structure. He was not like those adepts stationed in the clan's towers. They only had secondary control over the tower. The structure remained in the hands of the group itself. The benefit of owning a personal tower didn't need too much elaboration. 
A personal tower was a place for an adept to rise to prominence and a place for them to establish themselves. Most adepts would invest everything they had into their tower, and pass it on to their descendants or their beloved disciple upon death, treating it as if it was part of their bloodline. Naturally, second-grade adept Fugan and third-grade adept Sanazar both had individual towers. They conducted the majority of their essential or secret research there. The adept's tower in Feignan City was more of a public tower that belonged to the clan. Fugan and Sanazar only returned here once in a while to deal with the clan's affairs. They preferred to spend most of their time in their own towers. The clan would actively help high-grade adepts construct an adept's tower of their own, but this was not the case for first-grade adepts. Even someone as close to the inner circle of the clan as Kyohan was not qualified to own a personal tower. Of course, if you could hand over the 200,000 crystal construction fee, you were free to build it of your own accord. However, an ordinary adept would take 60 to 100 years just to save up that number of crystals. Someone like Kyohan had a steady crystal income from the clan's territory and resource sites. Moreover, his skill at voodoo beast creation was a respectable expertise that brought him quite a lot of additional income from commissions throughout the years. Yet, Kyohan still didn't possess an adept's tower of his own. Adept Grim, may I know if you have chosen the construction location for your adept's tower? Hani continued politely. It has been decided. The coordinates are as follows. Green reported the coordinates of the Plaguewood. Hanny started flipping through and checking his maps on the other end of the light screen. He frowned when he finally found the location that Green had given him. Adept Green, are you sure you want to construct your adept's tower there? You should know that this is an area within the Black Forest. Even though this is only the edge of the Black Forest, you are still taking an inestimable risk in doing so. I am sure. I am a fire adept, and I found a small fire attribute lung of the earth there. It is most suited for my future development. Both Fugan and Hani paused for a moment when they heard Green's words. They couldn't help but envy the young adept for his fortune. If there was a lung of the earth near the adept's tower, the architects had methods to connect it with the tower's energy room. In doing so, the tower would possess a far greater supply of energy compared to other towers. Furthermore, this particular tower would possess fire energy, the one element that was the most compatible with its owner. Once the tower was built, Green could maintain a meditation efficiency and energy regeneration rate that was several times that of his peers. Congratulations, Adept Green! Your luck is amazing. Adept Hani couldn't help but sigh once again, but there are some things that I have to tell you beforehand. A basic adept's tower like this one doesn't possess a teleportation array. If you want to construct one, you will have to pay an additional cost. Of course, if you are willing to offer up the teleportation array to be part of the Genterim Public Teleportation Network, the Genterim Association might be open to bearing this cost for you. How much does it cost to add on a teleportation array? Grim asked curiously. The bare minimum will be a hundred thousand magical crystals. Grim fell silent. Although he already had some degree of understanding about the difficulty of constructing an adept's tower, he was stunned by that exorbitant pricing. Fortunately, the construction of this tower was mostly for the benefit of training and refining his spirit. He didn't require such an intimate connection with the outside world. Temporarily giving up on the teleportation array wasn't too much of a loss. The two adepts talked over a bit more of the specifics, and eventually cut the connection on the crystal once they had come to an agreement. It seems the most likely one to advance amongst the adepts of the clan will be you. Adept Fugan voiced his thoughts right as Green was about to leave. In the end, Fugan couldn't help but feel a strong sense of amazement at the speed that Grim had improved ever since he brought the young adept into the clan. Grim expressed his thanks once more. He then promptly returned to Pinecone Town and silently waited as adept Hani had asked him. 
The three adepts of the Divini Trade Company reached the town two days later. Green still held great respect for this trade company that the Silver Union had stationed in the Gentrum area. The trip to the castle in the sky had allowed him to see, firsthand, the power and strength of the Silver Union. The army of war statues that could blot out the sky was so fearsome that seeing it almost made you feel despair. The Silver Union's monopoly over the esoteric adepts had indirectly allowed them to corner the market over all sorts of construction techniques. The craftsmen that were esoteric adepts were the only ones that could arrange things like adepts' towers and teleportation arrays. While most clans did cultivate support adepts such as array masters, architects, potions masters, alchemists, and golem masters, they still had no choice but to rely on the scholars of the Silver Union for the core technology. On the other hand, those smaller clans that were not able to cultivate their own support adepts had to spend enormous amounts of money to purchase the services of the Silver Union. Divini Trade Company was a unique organization that the Silver Union had stationed in other lands. They were singularly responsible for the construction of adepts' towers. Grimm had already made his preparations by the time the Divini's array master, architect, and the combat adept that had been sent to protect them finally arrived in Pinecone Town. Five manticles waited outside of the town, their existence surprised the three visitors. It wasn't odd to see magical creatures retained as guards and transportation. However, most of these magical creatures were reared near the headquarters of the clan itself. The fact that Adept Green was so easily able to conjure up five Adept-level manticles to transport them near the Black Forest spoke volumes about his influence and power in this region. Of course, the various wounds on the manticles that had yet to heal was a clear sign that Green had only recently tamed them. That caused the Divini Adepts to be even more curious and expectant of the fire attribute lung of the earth that Green had described to them. Chapter 404 Wandering Adepts a distance of 150 kilometers was nothing to adepts. They would have crossed that distance in two or three hours if it wasn't for the Black Forest. There were rules when in the Black Forest. Even ten lives weren't enough if you wanted to fly through the skies recklessly. Most powerful magical creatures couldn't be bothered to deal with those bugs that snuck past the edges of their borders. However, if you were to boldly fly across their heads, that would be a direct provocation. The five manticles were native beasts of this place. They had a perfect understanding of all the hunting areas of the various magical creatures along the way. They didn't fly high. Instead, they stuck to the forest canopy and wound through the place, trying their best to avoid the territory of powerful magical creatures. Thus, the four adepts safely crossed this stretch of the forest and reached the conspicuous plague wood. And here was the home of the Manticore family. The five Manticores folded their wings, and their magnificent bodies dove into the cave. Violent gusts of wind blew in every direction, shocking the bats in the cave and throwing them into a panic. Regardless of how frantic they were, not a single one of them dared to come within ten meters of a Manticore. In this area, the Manticores were the undisputed leaders. The Manticores ignored this group of unpaid watchdogs and continued into the cave. They flew past stalactites and stone pillars, avoiding every obstacle with ease as they entered a dark tunnel in the corner of the cave. They unfurled their wings and glided within the tunnel. It was only when the geography narrowed that they packed their wings and returned to the ground, running as an ordinary lion would. Once there was more space, they expanded their wings and quickly traveled further into the cave. This place was their home. They were familiar with every passage and pillar. W to their night vision, the dimness of the cave was no problem for these manticles. They were like fish swimming past the coral at the bottom of the ocean, freely weaving between stones, boulders, and stalagmites as they made their way into the underground and reached the cavern with the lava well that Green had discovered. The space in the cavern was much larger than the rest of the tunnels and caves they had passed through. In fact, it was so large that it appeared empty. The three Silver Union adepts that had been sitting with their eyes closed couldn't help but open them. 
they started surveying the environment. In particular, the lava well in the center of the cavern drew the attention of the two esoteric adepts. They excitedly walked towards the lava well once they got off the manticles. They then took out a strange magical tool and started taking measurements of the conditions. The man named Eugene was a combat adept. His only job was to protect these two esoteric adepts. He had no interest in this unique area. He nodded at Grim and started to walk around the lava well aimlessly. Grim let out an awkward cough when he saw the two esoteric adepts scurrying as they took their measurements. However, his cough didn't seem to have caught the attention of the two passionately immersed esoteric adepts. Rather, he managed to draw the attention of the wandering Eugene. What is it? What else do you need? Adept Eugene's tone was cold and harsh, there was a sense of sternness and solemnity to the energy radiating from his body. Eh, ah, I just wanted to ask if there was anything I needed to help with regarding the construction of the tower. We don't need any help from you. Adept Eugene rebuked Green with a single sentence, if you had the ability, you wouldn't have needed to hire us for the job. This location is a decent one. It's quite suited for the construction of an adept's tower. Then what do I need to do? Nothing. Just leave. It will only take nine days for a small basic tower like this one to be built. Once we've finished everything, I will go and inform you. You will complete the sacrificial ceremony of the tower spirit. Very well, you can leave now. At this moment, Green was so shocked by Eugene's arrogance and impoliteness that he couldn't even bother refuting. However, his shock quickly faded away once he remembered what kind of existence the Silver Union was. This type of construction was a monopoly of theirs after all. After they had obtained their monopoly over most of the techniques and knowledge related to the esoteric adepts, the other adept clans and organizations had to rely on them if they wanted to construct an adept's tower quickly. The Sarubo had architects and array masters, but these strategic talents were all placed in the outer realms under the direct command of great adept Sarubo himself. Having them cross the plane barrier and return to the world of adepts to build a crude tower for a mere first-grade adept was a little extreme. Even third-grade Sanazar didn't have the authority to give them such an order. All the esoteric adepts that the Sarubo clan had painstakingly cultivated had been trained and prepared for planar wars. No one would make them labor for an ordinary adept of the clan. Thus, something like constructing Grimm's personal tower would have to fall on the shoulders of a specialized organization like the Divini Trade Company. Less than 15 minutes after bringing the adepts to the lava well, Grimm was politely booted out of the caverns by adept Eugene. It was apparent that these adepts did an excellent job of protecting their knowledge and techniques. Grim could still feel himself being monitored with magic, even after he left the caverns. It wasn't until he reached the manticore den that the feeling completely vanished. No need to be dejected, master. Gargamel, who had been holing up in the cave and putting the manticores to work for the past few days immediately hurried over when he heard the news. He consoled his master, every single adept from the three major forces is like that. You get used to it over time. Oh? You know about all three of the major forces? Grim asked curiously, could you tell me more about them? Keika. Of course. An expression of hatred appeared on Gargamel's shriveled old face, those who have never experienced the pain of being a wandering adept would never understand. We are like mice running in the streets, oppressed and beaten down by the clan adepts wherever we go. We have no choice but to pinch our noses and flatter the managers of the public adepts towers, all for the sake of gathering knowledge and purchasing cheaper materials. Then why don't you join a clan? Your qualifications as a potions master guarantee you a place in any mid-sized adept clan, as long as you are willing to join them. Why the wandering about? and the tough life of being looked down upon. Master, the fact that you would say such a thing only proves that you have yet to understand the true nature of these adept clans. 
When you join a clan as an esoteric adept, you will find that they truly regard your existence to be of great significance. They are more than willing to invest resources in you. However, from then onwards, you will have forever lost your freedom. Freedom? Yes, freedom. Gargamel sighed, the more they invest in you, the more they expect to get from you. A potions master like myself will have a quota imposed upon him upon joining a clan. Every year, I will have to hand over a certain amount of potions to the clan. A person like myself, who has neither influence or power, will most definitely be asked to create an abnormal number of potions. If I want to complete my task, I will have to spend my days trapped in an uncomfortable lab, continuously repeating the same dull actions, day and night. Green rubbed his chin as he listened in silence. The consequence of this would be a complete lack of time to meditate or improve my abilities. Since I became an adept, I have already spent most of my time on the pointless concoctions of numerous potions. And that was how my body has slowly deteriorated over the years. Gargamel was only 89 years old. He wasn't even considered middle-aged among the adepts that often live to two or even three hundred years. However, his body and his face were about as bad as those ancient adepts at the end of their lifespan. Aren't there still plenty of high-grade adepts amongst the esoteric adepts? You, Green was somewhat confused. Master, you are referring to the Silver Union adepts, aren't you? Gargamel cackled coldly the adepts that a large organization like them would invest in and waste resources to allow advancement are all their own people. All of them are descendants of the higher-ups of the organization. They would never be willing to do so for outsiders. After all, the resources you sink into an untalented esoteric adept such that he may advance to second grade would be more than enough for you to make two or three second grade combat adepts. They would never part with so many resources if it wasn't one of their own. Green had felt this disparity in improvement rate himself. Within the Sarubo clan, Feria was a potions master, and Kiohan was a voodoo beast master. Both of them had a support specialty. However, their combat abilities were so poor that Green didn't even regard them as a threat. The speed at which their powers increased was like a tortoise's crawl when compared to Green. Green had barely seen them three or four times a year ever since they returned from the night's plane. Most of the time, they spent their days in their labs. They would only come out for a walk every few weeks. Sometimes, they even ignored their meals and relied on nutrition pills to sustain themselves. The extended periods without exercise, the exposure to harmful materials, and the failure to care for their spirits had a significant impact on them. Their spirits would even wither and waste away if they didn't properly care and maintain them. In fact, it would be a miracle if their powers didn't diminish in such an environment. However, compared to the deterioration of their powers, what was even more unbearable was the loss of their freedom. A specialized adept painstakingly trained by the clan would never have the chance to go on adventures and explore on their own. No group would ever let their precious esoteric adepts wander with some strangers or journey on random adventures for the sake of some insignificant combat experience. Even when they had to go on explorations, the clan would send a large group of strong escorts along with them. The esoteric adept would be well guarded as they went to explore those low-risk ruins and hazard zones. It made it impossible for the esoteric adepts ever to get a chance to train and improve themselves. Green finally understood why Gargamel would rather become a wandering adept than join a clan. Adepts might look like a proud and glorious group on the outside, but if one were to delve deep into the workings of their organizations, they would find a despairing amount of internal oppression. Chapter 405 The Tower The Three Major Adept Powers The Northern Witches of the North Coast, the Silver Union of the West Coast, and the Adepts Association of the East Coast. They each had their respective knowledge legacies, culture, and traditions. They were extremely private organizations. Whenever people mentioned the Northern Witches, the first thing that came to mind would be their ferocity. 
tremendous ferocity. If it weren't for this bold and reckless nature of theirs, how would a group of witches have been able to expand and establish themselves in the resource-starved lands of the North? How are they able to ensure the continuing legacy of the witches for tens of thousands of years? It was this ferocity of theirs that allowed them to push back against the magical creatures of the Black Forest, fighting for every inch and foot of the precious land they now stood upon. The reason the citizens of the Northern Lands followed the witches so loyally was because of their contributions. The witches were the ones who stood at the forefront, resisting the tides of monsters with courage and might far greater than the male adepts. The witches were the true guardian goddesses of the North. In comparison, the Silver Union seemed to be a motley crew of talent. Their leaders were not as experienced at fighting as the Northern witches, but they were skilled at managing and creating monopolies over certain magics and technologies. They had floating forts, transportation arrays, golem armies, and vast numbers of scrolls, potions, and magic wands. All of these were either necessary, rare resources or daily consumables. Gaining the monopoly over these items allowed them to profit tremendously. They accumulated a fathomless amount of resources and magic crystals through this trade monopoly. Most people looked upon the Silver Union as a massive, super trade organization instead of an adept organization, and they scorned them because of it. The Adepts Association on the East Coast, on the other hand, could be called a true primary adept organization. Their most significant distinguishing feature was the comprehensiveness of their knowledge legacy, as well as their ability to make full use of their human resources. At the center of the continent, where the Gentrum area lied, the various clans were the ones who invaded and excavated the lesser plains. Each group undertook the initial investment of manpower and resources. The excavation and harvest of resources then formed the foundation of the clan's improvement. However, planar invasions were initiated by individual adepts in the Adepts Association. There were plenty of explorers in the Adepts Association. They were not powerful fighters, but they were very good at space exploration and plane tracking. They wandered through the depths of the boundless sea of stars, exploring one hazardous zone after another. And when they found a lesser plane that no one had conquered yet, they would put the planar coordinates on sale back in the association. The powerful adepts of the association then took turns to bid for the coordinates. The adept that successfully obtained a set of coordinates recruited a team of suitable adepts and employed aggressive means to shatter the plane barrier and establish a forward base in the lesser plane. Once a teleportation array was constructed, the Adepts Association would take care of the rest. The invasion, domination, and removal of the resources were left to specialized expert adepts within the association. The adepts that managed to establish a forward base only needed to wait and reap the rewards of their efforts. All the lesser planes owned by the Adepts Association were obtained through such means. The association was only responsible for maintaining rule over the planes while the adepts were the mercenaries they hired to do the dirty work. In doing so, the association was able to free up some of their strongest adepts from the arduous process of planar domination. They no longer needed to go through invasion, domination, purging, and establishing their rule. The entire business became much more straightforward. The surplus workforce then invested in the conquering and domination of even more lesser planes. They strengthened themselves with the resources stolen from the other planes, continuing to use their overwhelming power to strike at even more worlds. This chain was the sustainable path of development that the Adepts Association had chosen for themselves. That was why they were the unchallenged champion amongst the three major Adept powers. The Silver Union was second, and the Northern Witches were the weakest. However, if one judged their force based on their performance in small-scale skirmishes between their adepts, the Northern Witches would be the most powerful. The Adepts Association would be second, and the Silver Union would be last. This ranking was the current political situation in the world of adepts. On the other hand, the Gentrum Association in the center of the continent was only a loose alliance of adept clans. 
They appeared to have the most adepts, the most population within their lands, the most resources, and the most land, but their strength was meager compared to the major powers. The reason the three dominant powers hadn't assimilated the Gentrum Association was due to the caution and unease between the influences. Each of the three powers feared that any reckless action might invite an alliance of the other two against themselves. Thus, the three major powers tried their best to expand their influence within the Gentrum Association through trade and other means. However, the exclusive and xenophobic nature of the local adepts made it hard for them to gain any real progress. The old fogies of the Gentrum Association frequently fought over power and influence, but they became unusually united whenever it seemed the three major powers wanted to interfere in their affairs. They would rather kill wrongfully than let something pass by their eyes. No adept clan of Gentrum was allowed to favor one of the three major forces. Every single clan that had been infiltrated by the three major powers had been inexplicably defeated and exterminated in an unexpected clan war. There were no exceptions. As there was still plenty of time, Grim continued his lengthy conversation with Gargamel. Grim did have some understanding of the three major powers through books and personal contacts. However, his conversation with Gargamel still helped him a lot. He learned plenty of open secrets many adepts widely discussed. Of course, during his free time, Grim couldn't help but wonder how the two Silver Union adepts were going to build an adept's tower so quickly. After all, back in the Knight's Plain, the Cerubo clan had sent out two or three dozen clan elites and barely managed to construct the foundation for a war tower within a month. The Silver Union had only sent two architects here on this errand. Grim couldn't believe this to be true, no matter how he thought about it. The number of stone materials, metals, and magical gemstones required in the construction of an adept's tower was terrifying. Could the two architects have brought everything with them? Of course, the location that Grim had picked was extremely convenient as well. The volcanic rock could be put to use and help save plenty of resources. Even so, this was still a massive undertaking. Shouldn't it be virtually impossible for two adepts to build something like this, even if they didn't rest for all nine days? The more he thought about it, the more unbelievable it seemed to be. However, Grim did have some idea of how they could accomplish this impossible mission. They must have brought along plenty of construction golems to solve their lack of human resources. But what about the carving of the runic arrays? For an adept tower to become a magical facility that was entirely controlled by the adept, every single stone of the tower needed to be engraved with runic arrays with various functions. Reinforcement runes, magic resistance runes, anti-divination runes, every one of these runes was necessary. Not to mention there was still the magical circuits and energy nodes that needed to be taken care of. These things covered the structure of the tower. The sheer amount of work was a headache to think about. How were they supposed to do this with just two adepts? Could the Silver Union have invented some sort of golem construct that could carve energy circuits and runic arrays on its own? That made absolutely no sense. The task was far too complicated and delicate for the likes of inanimate beings. Nine days quickly passed by while Green mused and guessed. Finally, the adept known as Eugene stepped out of the cavern and sent a magical message to Green. Green hastily brought Gargamel and Sabrina along with him as he hurried into the cavern underneath. A crimson tower stood silently in the middle of the massive cave. The body of the tower was built with volcanic rocks, and the inside of the tower was filled with rich fire energy causing the tower itself to radiate a faint red light. If Green wasn't mistaken, the lava well itself had likely been assimilated into part of the tower's foundation. The energy room was also connected to the sea of lava beneath. That meant that this tower would never run out of energy. At least, not fire energy. A pair of adamantium doors slowly opened as they walked towards the tower. The three Silver Union adepts respectfully waited for Green's arrival. 
The array master held a strange crystal glowing with rainbow lights in his hands. This is the control crystal of the tower's core array. You need to use it to activate all the runic arrays in the Adept's tower. It is only then that the tower will be considered to have activated. Very well, you should go in alone to complete your soul verification. Excitement appeared on Green's handsome face. He silently nodded and took the strange crystal into his hands. Hard and cool. Strange magical energies seemed to be swelling within the transparent crystal. Grim took a brief look at the gem and nodded at the three adepts to express his gratitude. He then slowly walked into the tower. There were five levels to the tower. The first thing Grim saw when he entered was a massive arcane hall. It would be the public area of activity for the apprentice adepts in the future. Perhaps this place might be crowded and filled with magical facilities in the future, but for now, it was no more than an empty hall. Grim saw a small library to the left of the hall. The apprentice dwellings were on the right. They consisted of a row of small stone rooms. Naturally, there was no furniture in there either. The spiral staircase that led upwards was in the corner of the hall. The stairs hadn't undergone elaborate treatment and polishing. The carved stairs and walls appeared to be somewhat crude and rough. The entire layout of the tower had been projected into his mind when he held the control crystal in his hands. However, the elementium altar in the energy room had yet to be activated, and the core array had not connected to all the various runic arrays spread across the tower. Thus, the tower remained silent and incapable of responding to his commands. Grim stepped onto the spiral staircase, and some unique runic passwords and hand signs appeared before his eyes. He needed to chant these words while making the proper hand signs to open the temporary passage to the warehouse and energy room in the basement. Otherwise, this spiral staircase only led upwards. It also meant that anyone without control authority would have no hope of intruding into the resource warehouse and the energy room. Green hesitated for a moment. He suppressed the desire to rush into the energy room and followed the stairs upwards towards the fourth floor, where the core array was located. Chapter 406 Activating the Tower According to the control crystal, the core array resided on the fourth level. There were five surface levels to the tower and two underground levels, making for a total of seven levels. The two underground levels were the energy room and the resource warehouse respectively. This layout was typical for most adepts' towers. The first level functioned as the dwellings of the apprentices, the arcane hall, the library, the academic hall, and the dining area. The second level had a magical garden, a breeding room, an incubation chamber, a small laboratory, and a magic practice range. The third level contained the ceiling room, the book storage, the golem factory, the alchemy lab, and the scroll crafting chamber. The fourth level was where the adepts' rooms, the study room, the meeting room, and the core array were. The fifth level had the teleportation room, private labs, and the workshops. That was only a basic layout that Grim had requested. Most of the required magical facilities were still missing. He would have to invest a lot more before he could have the place functioning as he wanted. In ordinary circumstances, the apprentice adepts only had access to the first and second levels. The pseudo adepts and the advanced apprentices would be able to borrow the use of certain facilities on the third level by submitting requests. Fourth level and above was restricted to only adepts. Moreover, they had to be a trusted adept that belonged to the tower itself, outsider adepts could only stay on the third level. As the tower had not undergone spatial expansion, there wasn't too much space to move around. Still, it would be no problem to sustain the lives of nearly a hundred adepts and apprentices. Groom swiftly walked into the bright central control hall. There were white marble floors and rich elementium energy faintly radiating from the walls. Embedded in the array at the center of the room was a large crystal. An odd rune was flashing and wavering at the center of this massive cluster of crystal, continuously letting out magical energy. 
Green bent his body to examine the crystal in detail. Soon, the chip had completed a quick scan of the crystal's internal structure and its composition. Weirdly enough, even the chip didn't manage to glean any information. Beep. Discovered unknown energy crystal substance. No matching substance type found in the data library. No signs of artificial synthesis either. Initial estimates suggest crystal to be a substance from beyond this world. Was it a substance from beyond this world? That meant that this crystal wasn't a product from the world of adepts or a synthetic gem created by a high-grade adept. Instead, this was a unique crystal taken from another plane. Or even the depths of the Sea of Stars. Grim took out the control crystal that the silver-robed adept had given him and realized that it was made of the same material as the large crystal before him. Moreover, when the rune within the giant crystal pulsed, the small one in his hand vibrated at the same frequency. It was almost as if the two crystals were breathing in sync. Green did as was instructed by the silver-robed adept. He placed the small crystal on the indentation above the big one. He then cut his palm and pressed his bleeding hand against the crystal. Beep. Detecting data connection passage. Construct connection. Construct. Green felt his sensory world expand infinitely as his spirit connected with the massive crystal. His spirit had instantly extended to every single corner of the tower. An enormous screen of light suddenly appeared in his mental space. The screen listed a wide variety of complicated commands. And the first emergency command to be listed at the top was Activate the tower. Activating the tower wasn't just starting up its functions. What it meant was that Green would now possess the highest authority over the Adept's tower. Unless he conducted a special magical ceremony and willingly wiped away the soul brand he had left in the crystal, he would forever possess the highest authority over this tower. Chip, have you discovered any safety issues? Beep. Initial scans of control crystal complete. No backdoor programs or traps discovered. More comprehensive scanning will begin once the tower has been activated. Recommend host immediately activate the tower. Green solemnly gave the order to activate the tower, and the entire structure trembled. An elementum brilliance with a trace of holiness and divinity suddenly lit up in the energy room. A black hole the size of a fist slowly opened above the elementum altar. Traces of prismatic mist drifted out of the hole. They were immediately guided towards the elementum pool the moment they exited the black hole. The fog then settled at the bottom of the pool. In less than seven minutes, the rich magical energy had become thick and heavy. More and more rainbow mist gathered at the bottom of the elementum pool, causing it to become moist and damp. Soon, a transparent yet viscous layer of water appeared at the bottom of the pool. It was not water extracted from the elementum world, it was liquid elementum that had been extracted from the air. Elementum energy usually existed in a gaseous state. However, the elementum pool compressed the elementum energies and caused their unit concentration to increase dramatically, causing them to exist in this liquid state. If the energy room continued to function for an even more extended period, this liquid elementum would be further compressed and forced into solid-state magical crystals. And that would be the most stable currency in the world of adepts. With the activation of the energy room, surge after surge of magical energy was drawn from the surroundings. These energies were slowly circulated into the tower systems. From the second underground level to the first underground level, and then across the entire tower, the radiance of energy started to glow wherever the runic arrays extended. Gargamel and the three silver union adepts silently watched as a trace of light shone at the bottom of the tower and slowly spread across every corner of the building. This tower that had been a dull crimson color now burned brightly like a beautiful fire coral, displaying itself to the adepts in all its beauty and wonder. Please come in, my guests. Welcome to my adept's tower. The air boomed with Grim's boisterous voice. 
The closed doors immediately opened at the sound of his voice. Graham once again met up with the three Silver Union adepts in a guest hall on the third level to discuss other matters. Gargamel, on the other hand, had been given partial authority by Green. He was wandering the tower, eagerly exploring every bit of the building. Sir Green, if you have no other requests, we will be on our way. The one responsible for coordination was still adept Eugene. It was apparent that the three spoiled Silver Union adepts wanted to leave as soon as possible now that they had completed their task. This place was unpopulated and had none of the luxuries they were accustomed to. They didn't even want to extend their stay by a single second. No need to rush. Grim quickly spoke to persuade them to stay, the foundation of this tower has been constructed, but there are far too many magical facilities that I still need to be built. May I ask about your price when it comes to this? Adept Eugene was incredibly straightforward. He handed a piece of parchment over to Green. Teleportation array, 100,000 magical crystals. Detection room, 70,000 magical crystals. Greater magic practice range, 80,000 magical crystals. Room of bindings, small, 4,000 magical crystals, medium, 20,000 magical crystals, large, 50,000 magical crystals. Ceiling room, 30,000 magical crystals. Pool of purification, 20,000 magical crystals. Large omnipurpose alchemy lab, 130,000 magical crystals. Includes a complete set of tools and facilities. Golem factory, 40,000 magical crystals can only be used for the creation and repair of adept-level magical statue constructs. Scroll crafting chamber, 3,000 magical crystals. Includes all tools. Enchantment lab, 7,000 magical crystals. Alchemical slave, adept-level, 20,000 magical crystals, apprentice-level, 800 magical crystals. Voodoo beast, adept-level, 16,000 magical crystals, apprentice level, 600 magical crystals. Magical garden servant, flower fairy, 200 magical crystals creature, genie, 170 magical crystals creature. Tower slave, strength type minotaur, 20 magical crystals creature, cool boar, 8 magical crystals creature, ogre, 25 magical crystals creature, dragon spawn, 40 magical crystals creature. Tower Slave, Specialized Halfling Gourmet, 300 Magical Crystals Creature, Dwarven Smith, 120 Magical Crystals Creature, Grass Fairy, Female, 700 Magical Crystals Creature, Male, 600 Magical Crystals Creature, Siren Apprentice, 1700 Magical Crystals Creature. The parchment wasn't large, but its contents were plentiful. Most of the things listed here were necessary for the operation of an adept's tower. However, Green felt his headache when he read through the prices listed behind each item. If he were a veteran adept that had lived for a hundred years, he would at least have some capital on hand. Unfortunately, he was not. He was just an ordinary adept that had been fighting tooth and claw to make his bucket of gold. In fact, it hadn't been that long since he had bid farewell to his label as a newly advanced adept. As for savings, he had spent most of the resources and magical crystals he had obtained during the last planar on Alice and her battle of fate. He could barely squeeze out thirty to forty thousand magical crystals if he counted everything he had. This amount was clearly insufficient if he wanted to complete the tower's functions. It was barely enough for Green to get the tower running. It wasn't as if Green had no valuable items on hand. As long as he was willing to part with his last space stone, every financial problem he had would be solved. The problem was that he just wasn't willing to. Thus, after a lengthy negotiation with adept Eugene, Green paid for a small fire altar in the hall on the first floor. He then bought some tools and facilities for the alchemy lab the golem factory, the scroll creation chamber, and several other places. He also purchased some magical seeds for the garden. 
Apart from these basic amenities, Grimm also bought two halfling gourmets, two dwarven smiths, and two fairies. He had no choice. He and Gargamel had to live here from now on. They couldn't possibly be expected to go out hunting on their own for every meal. That was why purchasing food and daily consumables and leaving them to these slaves to manage was the best course of action. Meanwhile, the role of the tower guards fell upon the eleven manticles. Once the Silver Union adepts had swiftly constructed the fire altar, Grim immediately placed the fire lord scepter that he had no use for on the platform. This way, he could summon up to five fire elementals from the altar on a daily basis. These elementals could serve as his servants that helped in the operation of the tower. Over time, this labyrinthine underground tunnel network would become dominated by fire elementum. This development would substantially increase the security of the tower. Green would also be able to summon even more fire elementals to serve as free labor. Of course he chose to construct a fire altar first. Chapter 407 The Tower is Complete when Grim had seen Alice controlling a tower of her own back in the northern lands, he had thought of it as an easy matter. However, it was only now that he managed an adept's tower of his own that he understood the pain of owning a tower. He had always lived in the Sarubo clan's tower in the past. There wasn't an urgent need for resources. He had also frequently been burdened with matters he had to attend. Consequently, he never quite had the time to go around accumulating funds. Now that he held a tower in his hands, the sheer consumption of magical crystals and resources was enough to make his head hurt. His situation was nothing like Alice's. The Witch of Fate was working alone as of now, but she was still supported by all the accumulated resources of the Witches of Fate. Her starting point was much further along than Greem's. The gap in their power would only grow wider as time passed. That was Grimm's most significant concern. His first planar invasion experience and the abundant wealth to be harvested had captivated his imagination. Countless times, Grimm had fantasized about conquering foreign planes with an army of adepts he had assembled himself. They would obtain vast lands and mountains of resources that would be used to strengthen themselves further. However, in every single one of his fantasies, he was the leader, only he could be the leader. But if Alice accumulated more influence and power than him, who would be the leader when they allied? Who was the subordinate? The question was a simple one, but it deeply troubled Green. Once both of their forces had developed to that extent, they would not be able to avoid facing the issue, even with the vague feelings they had for each other. Moreover, adepts were pragmatic beings. Minor romantic feelings could not possibly subvert the difference in status between two individuals. Alice was the leader of the Witches of Fate, albeit with slightly insufficient power as of yet. Grim, on the other hand, was a mere fire adept with a handful of subordinates he could call upon. When the time came for them to join hands, what was Grim supposed to use to make Alice submit to him? How was he supposed to make Alice subordinate to him? Alice and Grim each had an adept's tower of their own now. Alice possessed the Tower of Origin for the Witches of Fate, one of the most potent adept's towers on the continent. She didn't have much right now, but as long as she held on to her identity as the Witch of Fate, she would have no problem expanding her influence and might. In fact, it couldn't be said that Alice was starting from nothing. She was only expanding upon the foundation of the Witches of Fate, while slowly restoring the legendary witch branch to its former glory. She was practically a rich kid born with a silver spoon in her mouth. Grim was the pauper that had to start from scratch. Of course, Grim could contact Alice at any moment and ask for several tens or hundreds of thousands of magical crystals from her. If he did so, he could solve all the financial problems of his tiny tower. However, as an adept with wild ambition, Green would never bring himself to lower his status to ask Alice for help. He knew very well the problems that Alice had to face as well. The Tower of Fate might have a large reserve of magical crystals, 
but most of those assets were frozen for the sake of recruiting the magic fairies. What remained was barely enough to support the operation of that massive tower. Green was in a problematic position himself, but he wasn't in as dangerous situation as Alice was. The issue concerning the first witch of fate, the attitude of the other witch leaders towards her, and the internal affairs of the witches of fate that still lied in shambles, a single mistake in dealing with any one of them plunge her into doom and despair. The burden that Alice shouldered wasn't any lighter than Green's. In fact, most of the time Green was glad that he wasn't involved in those complex layers of conspiracy, where it was hard to tell friend from foe. The three Silver Union adepts left that night. The slaves and servants that Green purchased would also reach his tower within fifteen days. Green had half a month's time to get the tower in order. At the very least, he needed to start its essential functions and operations. Apart from the magical facilities, the adept's tower was also sorely lacking in the daily necessities for the adepts and apprentices. Replenishing these supplies was an issue that had to be dealt with immediately as well. After all, Grim couldn't possibly be expected to sleep on a stone bed, nor on wild game hunted by the manticles, and drink water summoned from the water elementation plane. It was acceptable if he had to lead a life like this for a few days, but even the most resilient adept wasn't able to endure this lifestyle for long periods of time. Green was silently thinking over these problems when he received a message from Snorlax. Snorlax and his party of a dozen people had reached Pinecone Town. They were hiring mercenaries to escort them to the Adept's Tower. Green paused for a moment. He considered for a moment and handed control of the tower over to Gargamel. He brought the eleven manticles out of the cave and hurried towards Pinecone Town. Half a day later, Green was able to meet up with Snorlax twenty kilometers away from the town. He had used his mental connection with Snorlax to locate the party. There were sixteen people in total. The ones leading the way were Love and the others who he had recruited during their last trip. Green's black eyes swept over the party members as he leaped off the back of the majestic manticore leader. Apart from Snorlax and the apprentices of his faction, he also saw Merrill amongst them. Merrill. Why did you come along? An expression of idolization and envy flashed in Merrill's eyes as she looked at the strange lion-like beast. Teacher, you are amazing. It's only been a few days, and you've already managed to tame such a powerful magical beast. Green wore a simple grey robe. He was tall in stature and possessed a handsome face. His flowing crimson hair fell upon his shoulders, and he held in his hand a mysterious black staff with crimson patterns. He gave the party members a sense of stability and security when he stood before them like this. Very well, we can talk about all this once we reach the tower. I've specially brought the manticles to carry everyone over. Let's go. Love and his two party members followed the road back to town while the eleven manticles carried the fourteen adepts and apprentices on their backs. They unfurled their wings, roared, and flew towards the depth of the black forest. To save time, Green made Snorlax ride along with him so that he could ask the goblin the reason for his visit. Master, of course, it's to bring you some necessary goods. Snorlax excitedly explained, you've only just constructed your tower, it's certain that you would lack in daily necessities. I went to look for Lady Merrill, and we decided to bring these things to you along with your disciples and apprentices. A violent gust of wind swept across their heads. Snorlax's large ears fluttered behind his head, and his green hair blew into a quiff. Even so, there was no stopping the goblin's enthusiasm. He continued to wave his hands and eagerly spoke about his actions. However, near the end of his lengthy speech, Snorlax leaned against Green's ear and whispered, Master, apart from the necessities, I have also brought you some magical crystals. The business of the goblin shop has been phenomenal recently. This one took the opportunity to earn as much as he could, all for the sake of Master. Magical crystals. How much? Green asked doubtfully. 
120,000 magical crystals. Snorlax yelped with a wide grin on his face. If Grim hadn't caught Snorlax by the collar, he would probably have fallen off the manticles back out of sheer excitement. A hundred and twenty thousand? An expression of amusement appeared on Grim's face. He didn't say anything to Snorlax's words. He wasn't a rookie that had just emerged from some unknown rural place. A small goblin shop relying on the protection of a clan made a hundred and twenty thousand magical crystals in less than ten years. A legendary story like this might be good for the taverns, but it wasn't to be taken seriously. Grim shook his head and laughed and chose to not think about the matter. Instead, he turned to join his apprentices in appreciating the beautiful scenery beneath them. Birds flitted through the trees as the manticores flew across the canopy of the vast forest. The entire place was brimming with life. From high above the skies, all you could see was the endless stretch of leaves and canopy. Black. Perhaps this was the only color in this forest. The woods were dark and the trees towered above everything else. When looking up from within the dense forest, the thick branches and dense leaves cut up the sky into pieces of blue ribbons. Spots of light scattered across the ground, flickering and flashing as the leaves swayed in the winds. The black and boundless forest continued forever, from low bushes to tall trees. This land was a paradise for flora. Iron oaks, firs, spruces, cedars, and all varieties of trees grew straight up to the sky. Thick, nameless vegetation and vines filled the gaps between the trees. Any outsider would find it difficult to traverse such an ancient and primal forest. Of course, there were all sorts of forest creatures in such an environment. However, they were not the true owners of the Black Forest. The only ones that could make that claim were the tide of terrifying magical creatures and monsters that inhabited the forest. The apprentices that could follow Adept Merrill on this visit were all advanced apprentices or pseudo-adepts. They had all ventured into the edges of the Black Forest and fought with beasts, magical creatures, monsters, and corruptors in there. They might be victorious and return with resources and spoils of war, or they might not be, being forced to hide in the swamp or the decaying vegetation, praying to escape the notice of the monsters. If an apprentice wanted to become stronger, they had to experience such tragic and stressful situations several times. It was because they continued to grow from their victories and defeats that they were able to become stronger. In their eyes, the Black Forest was the land of the magical creatures and a paradise for monsters. It was also the battlefield from which they obtained resources. Yet, at this moment, they were riding upon the legendary manticore flying far above all those frightening beasts below. They were freely weaving through the trees, flying across lakes, and making their way past mountains and rivers. This relaxed and comfortable feeling was a refreshing one to experience. It was also the real might of an adept. Even a powerful magical creature could only beg for its life and become an obedient slave when placed before an omnipotent adept. This feeling was pretty goddamn good. Chapter 408 Bad News The arrival of Merrill and the others certainly made the tower more lively than before. Moreover, they had brought plenty of daily necessities and supplies along with them, replenishing much of what the tower sorely lacked. Green gave the apprentices access to the first and second levels and had them slowly develop the two floors. Meanwhile, he brought Snorlax and Merrill to the meeting hall on the fourth floor to discuss other matters. Snorlax took out his sack and handed it over to Grim in front of Merrill. The 120,000 magical crystals he mentioned were inside. However, this time Snorlax honestly admitted that Alice had sent them through a witch's trading company. Alice would never send such a huge number of crystals without any reason. Did she say anything else? An ominous feeling rose in Grim's heart. The messenger she sent had a message. Be careful of the assault of the magical creatures. Merrill replied. Her words shocked Green. The young fire adept lowered his head in contemplation. Assault of the magical creatures. 
Other people might not understand the implications of this sentence, but something flashed through Grimm's mind when he heard this reminder, an interesting story that he had read in ancient tomes arose in his mind. There were plenty of examples of magical creature attacks when adept powers had tried to encroach upon the Black Forest. It was almost as if the magical creatures had a stubborn belief that human expansion into the woods would profoundly affect and deteriorate their living environment. That was why they would launch reckless assaults on the humans whenever they tried to move into the Black Forest. Sometimes the magical creatures even gathered together to coordinate a siege effort against human settlements near the Black Forest. In the past, Grimm had only thought of these as battles between human adepts and powerful magical creatures. He thought these were battles for territory. He felt that as long as he was cautious not to infringe upon the lands of the powerful magical creatures, he would never be in serious trouble. However, Alice's reminder made it impossible for Grimm to not reconsider the possibility of an assault by the magical creatures. He had rarely gone out from the underground since he arrived in Plaguewood. Naturally, it was impossible for him to have trespassed into any creature's territory. Then what was it that made his existence intolerable to the magical creature lords? Others might not be able to answer this question, but Grimm had a vague idea. The Adept's Tower With the establishment of the tower, the wandering magical energies would unavoidably be extracted from the surroundings to maintain its daily functions. This function resulted in an artificial drain of magic. The distribution of magical elementum varied from place to place. The more energy the tower extracted from the air, the thinner the density of elementum in the surroundings. This minor change wasn't significant to the ordinary woodland beasts, but it was as plain as day to magical creatures who possessed supernatural abilities. Truthfully, the magical creatures were magical beings born from immersion in the dense concentration of elementium. They were very sensitive to the flow and change of elementium particles. How could they possibly allow an outsider to do as they wanted in their land? To rob them of the elementium that they relied upon to survive? That was why the tower had become the target of the magical creature lord's hostility the moment the elementium altar had activated. Grimm promptly called upon Gargamel once he understood what was happening. He had Gargamel contact Eva the forest spirit. As expected, Eva sent back news of disturbances among the magical creatures. It seemed they were all gradually gathering towards Plaguewood. It was only now that Grimm understood why Alice had taken the effort to send a messenger and a hundred and twenty thousand magical crystals to him. It wasn't to help with his construction of the tower, but to help with the defense of the tower. The Elementium altar had been functioning for a day and a night at this point, but the liquid magical energy in the pool wasn't even enough to completely cover the bottom of the pool. That also wasn't taking into account the secondary Elementium pools and tertiary magic pools. The magical energies in those pools still existed in the gaseous state. They weren't dense enough to be converted into liquid yet. Most of the wandering elementium that the tower absorbed on a daily basis was being used to maintain and modify the environment within the tower. Only a small portion of the energy was directed towards the elementium pool. If the magical creatures attacked, the tower would have to activate all of its defense systems, when that happened, the wandering elementium particles wouldn't be enough to sustain the consumption of energy. Grimm had the chip do an elementary calculation. If the tower shut down all unnecessary magical facilities and runic arrays, then the elementium altar would probably be able to generate 27 to 28 magical crystals every day. However, in doing so, it would expose the adepts and the apprentices to the harsh conditions of the environment around them. The underground world was a dry, warm, and desolate place to live in without environmental control. No one could tolerate living under such conditions. On the other hand, activating the tower's defenses would take 12 to 15 magical crystals per day. If they wanted to run the necessary magical facilities, the consumption of magical crystals would go up to 20 to 22 magical crystals per day. After all, there were many magic doors defensive arrays, alarm arrays, and detection crystals within the tower. 
all these things consumed magical energy when they were activated. If one were to take into consideration the voodoo beasts, golem constructs, and the magical garden that were to be added afterward, the consumption of energy was going to increase further. Trying to rely on an adept's tower as the sole means to procure magical crystal was a childish and absurd line of thought. It was also why most adepts' towers only activated the lowest degree of defenses during peaceful times. Once war erupted and all the defenses were activated, the tower instantly became a money pit. The rate at which it devoured magical crystals was enough to make any adept cry in anguish and grief. Green was in a disastrous situation right now. Other adepts' towers might have several decades and even a century's worth of magical energy reserves. However, his adept's tower had absolutely nothing. His warehouse and treasury were so empty a mouse would starve to death if it were trapped inside. More importantly, Green didn't have anything resembling a magical crystal reserve. His entire tower was practically operating stark naked. Was he going to use a tower like this was for war? As he held them in his hands, Grim immediately understood the significance of the magical crystals that Snorlax had given him. These weren't magical crystals. These were the lifeline of the tower he was standing on right now. Grim would probably have grabbed his head and cried out loud if he were the only one in the room right now. However, at the moment, two of his subordinates were looking at him. Grim had no choice but to hide the feelings in his heart, regardless of how upset he was. Green smiled. Even though he really wanted to cry. Things aren't all that bad. Green rested his head against his hand as he thought, first, this tower isn't up on the surface. It won't be easy to siege, even for a horde of magical creatures. Their numbers won't matter if they get lost in this dark and sprawling labyrinth. That's the best and most convenient place to set up the first line of defense. Second, this is only the edge of the Black Forest. The possibility of a second-grade magical creature showing up isn't large. If it's only a group of first-grade magical creatures, we can rely on the tower's defenses to hold up against them. If things go well, we might even be able to counterattack and make a profit out of this. Most importantly, we have a sea of lava beneath our feet. If anyone angers me, I can draw upon the tower's powers and extract the lava from below to flood this cavern. What can those creatures do when that happens? After a logical analysis of the situation, Green slowly listed all the advantages and disadvantages they had on their side. To his surprise, he found that they weren't in an entirely passive position. It was only now that Green realized the reason Alice had so strongly supported his construction of a tower here. This location was an excellent place that was entirely compatible with his future development. There were no large adept clans nearby, and there were no terrifying magical creatures. It allowed Grim to avoid being harassed and troubled while he expanded his influence and power. Furthermore, there was a hidden sea of volcanic lava beneath Plaguewood. This resource had incredible significance to Grim's personal growth and development. He only needed to resist this attack by the magical creatures. When the light of his tower shone upon the nearby forest, this small stretch of the black forest would become his territory. If the magical creatures were unable to drive him away, then they would have no other option but to leave this place, migrating to foreign lands to find a new home. However, there weren't that many safe territories for these creatures to migrate to in the black forest. For the sake of their tribe and their species, these magical creatures had to band together to launch a frenzied attack at Grim's adept tower. Soon, Grim would face a tough defensive battle. Stonehammer Ruins A forest of stone pillars shaped by weathering throughout the ages, 15 kilometers east of Plaguewood. Either the forest spirit stood alone atop a tall stone pillar. The stones here had been shaved away and worn by wind and rain. Some were thick, while others were thin. Some were tall while some were short, not one of them looked alike. Looking from above the stone pillar, Eva saw that everything around here was a dull world colored in only yellows and black. 
Countless valleys, caves, and stone forests had been covered by the towering black trees, forming the complex geography of this place, as well as creating the perfect shelter for various magical creatures. Who knew how many dangerous fellows lurked in the shadows and the caves here, silently observing everything? All the adept level magical creature leaders had gathered here today, answering the call of the most senior of them all Tula, the demon hunting spider. They were aggressively discussing the presence of the human adepts that had appeared in the Manticles' territory. They had all felt the change in magical energy around the plague wood. The strange trembling and drain of magical elementium posed a dire threat to all the magical creatures present. Many of the oldest magical creatures instantly determined the existence of an adept's tower, there was no other way to explain the phenomenon. Adept's tower. The expressions on the faces of all magical creatures changed when they heard this name. This, this was a name that all magical creatures hated and feared. Because hearing that name meant that a considerable price had to be paid. Their land, their hunting grounds, and even their lives. Chapter 409 Dance of Monsters Several strange creatures of varying shapes and sizes took up the entire space of the stone forest. Amongst them was a three-headed demon hound, a dark tentacular, and a giant berserk gelada. Even though these creatures weren't on particularly friendly terms, they still managed to suppress their displeasure out of respect for Lord Tula's overwhelming power. They just exchanged hostile looks from a distance. Irrelevant characters such as forest spirits and two-headed ogres could only wait outside the stone forest, waiting upon the commands of the magical creature lords. Almost everyone is here. It is about time we start our operation. The first to speak was an etacap. It was one of the many aberrant descendants of the veteran Lord Tula. It looked like a human standing upright, yet it was a monster with the ugly appearance of a bug. Its words usually conveyed the will of Lord Tula. The three-headed demon hound raised its three wicked heads covered with rough and thick fur. All six of its crimson eyes fell upon the etacap as it spoke, and the plan. We can't recklessly rush at the human adept's tower like this. If the plan fails, you spiders can still return underground, but we who live on the surface will have to flee. We need a plan for this battle. As the leader of the fiend hounds in the area 60 kilometers northwest of Plaguewood, Unguja was the only three-headed demon hound in his pack. His three heads didn't just give him three separate attributes in the form of wind, fire, and poison. They also allowed him to possess superior intelligence. He might not be the most powerful lord in this stretch of the Black Forest, but he was undoubtedly one of the smartest and slyest of them all. Fiend hounds were a type of wolf-like magical creature that could transform into either a wolf or a goblin. Their actual appearance was that of a wolf with goblin features. They had frightening jaws and sharp claws. They were no different from wolves while they were still cubs. Every single part of them was the same, except for their size and their nails. When a fiend hound reached adolescence, its skin color would turn darker and darker, first becoming a shade of red and blue before finally turning completely blue. There was a unique evolutionary form among the fiend hounds, and that was the elite class three-headed demon hound. The bloodline inherited from Cerberus awakened within their bodies. Apart from their strong and powerful jaws, each of the three heads possessed unique magical abilities. The green head on the left could instantly fire wind blades, the red head on the right could shoot a chain of fireballs, while the main head in the middle possessed the poison breath skill. Compared to the power of his attacks, the three-headed demon hound had nothing much in the way of defense. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been relegated to his current position as one of the weakest magical creature lords. The demon hound might have a thick hide, but his thin and long waist was his biggest weakness. He had no means of resisting or enduring the swift strikes of stronger beasts. Thus, even though the demon hound loved slaughter, he had to resort to more underhanded means. Ambushes and sneak attacks were his favorite tactics, he rarely ever fought an enemy head-on. I agree with Unguja's opinion. 
we need a plan. Otherwise, I'd have reason to suspect that this is a conspiracy to exhaust our strength. The first to concur was a giant dark tentacular that looked like a squid. Emuru, the only dark tentacular in this entire area. He had the muscular body of a teenage human, but everything from his waist downwards had been replaced with thick and long tentacles. Furthermore, there were many fleshy extensions where his hands and fingers were supposed to be. The limbs continuously intertwined and pulsed, it was a disgusting sight to behold. Emuru was completely naked. There wasn't a piece of clothing or armor on his upper body. A strange cloud of black mist perpetually shrouded his body. His pitch black eyes sent shivers down a person's spine, even when it was still bright outside. As a lonesome but powerful magical creature, Emuru had no tribe members or even companions. However, his potent dark magic and capable close combat skills made him a challenging foe. Not many in this forest dared to provoke him. Chula, if your goal is to expel these human adepts, we will willingly follow behind you. However, we must see your spider army during the fight. Otherwise, this time it was a Medusa that spoke. It was Dana, a Medusa that had just completed her metamorphosis. As one of the known magical creature lords in this area, Dana the Medusa had seven or eight gorgons as subordinates, as well as a hundred underground creatures that acted as her servants. She was an elite class earth magical creature. She had the alluring body of a pretty human girl and the slender tail of a rattlesnake. However, her hair was what was truly terrifying. It was composed of countless tiny, creeping serpents. Moreover, her beautiful eyes would occasionally let out a frightening shine. Everyone looking into her eyes would find themselves consumed by petrification magic. She was nude as well. However, a thin layer of purple and black scales covered her proud bosom. Her exposed skin was soft, smooth, and white. Her slender arms looked weak and harmless, but they had the strength in them to tear a tiger apart. Apart from Tula the demon-hunting spider and his countless descendants, Dana was the most powerful and influential of the magical creature lords in this area. The arrogant Etikap didn't dare take the words of the Medusa lightly. He could only step aside and reveal his gigantic ancestor. Demon-hunting spider Tula. The spider took two steps forward. Tula's massive body took up Dana's entire vision. The Medusa couldn't help but fall silent and leaned backward slightly. The sheer size of Tula was far too overwhelming. She continued to stare cautiously at this domineering magical creature lord. Every area of the Black Forest had one such magical creature lord, a being of imposing power. They used their strength to hold onto the most bountiful lands, and wielded the influence to command the surrounding magical creatures. Anyone that went against their will would be exiled or eaten. There were no exceptions. That was why even Dana the Medusa, with all her power and influence, didn't dare to challenge Tula, who was eldest and most senior of all the magical creatures. Purple light glowed in the many compound eyes on the demon-hunting spider's head. However, his mouth didn't move. He spoke with his spiritual voice allowing everyone present to understand his thoughts through telepathy. The human adepts must die. Tula's voice was exceptionally rough and coarse, as if there were hundreds and thousands of chittering voices speaking at once, the adepts' tower must fall. Otherwise, our black forest will devolve. It will degrade. I will not tolerate this outcome. Now that the magical creature lord had given the declaration of war there was no more that needed discussing. Three days, Tula's voice continued to sound in the hearts of all the magical creature lords, you have only three days. Three days from now, you must bring all your subordinates here. Then, we will launch our attack, destroy the tower, and kill the adepts. Anyone who isn't present will have to face punishment from me. As Tula threatened them, Countless tiny spiders the size of fists emerged from underground, from the canopy, from the bushes, 
and from the cracks between the rocks. They flashed their fangs menacingly at all the magical creatures present. These tiny spiders were extremely weak individually, but there were far too many of them. Even elite-class magical creatures would have a hard time escaping without a scratch if so many spiders swarmed them at once. The faces of the magical creature lords turned green, but no one publicly opposed Tula's orders. As magical creatures, they very well aware of the consequences of allowing an adept tower to secure itself in this spot. The opponent would eventually exterminate them like prey in the wild. Thus, Tula's orders sounded harsh to the ears, but they were the correct course of action. They had no reason to object. A short moment later, Grim received the image recording crystal that Eva had sent back. Even Grim, with his calm demeanor, couldn't help but draw a cold breath when he saw all the magical creature lords in the crystal. Tula, the demon hunting spider, was most likely a magical creature at the peak of elite class. It meant that he would very likely have a portion of a second-grade magical creature's strength. Grim wasn't sure he could survive an ambush by a monster like this. The other magical creature lords, such as the three-headed demon hound, the medusa, the dark tentacular, the berserk gelada, and the wyvern king were all powerful elite-level magical creatures. Any single one of them alone would have been a troublesome opponent. Grim had no guarantee he could beat any of them in a duel. Not to mention the numerous ordinary magical creatures. Minotaurs, berserk geladas, hound fians, etacaps. Even someone of Eva's caliber was only one against a horde of hundreds and thousands. She would barely be a deciding factor during the war. Compared to these mighty creatures, the more numerous critter-like magical creatures didn't even draw Grim's attention. Grim had already made up his mind. Once the monsters reached the caverns, he would pull out all the stops. He was going to flood them with fire. A bottomless sea of lava rested right beneath the tower. If he could draw out this lava and inject it into the caverns, he would inflict massive damage upon the magical creatures. He didn't know how many of the powerful ones would die, but the weaker ones were doomed. They were currently outnumbered, outmatched, and the tower had no magical energy reserves to speak. However, the conclusion of the battle was not as obvious as it seemed. These rural monsters that stayed cooped up in their homes would never be able to imagine the true extent of cruelty and savagery that an adept was capable of. Grim had decided. If those magical creatures dared to come, he would leave them a lasting impression that they would never forget. Trying to outwit a human adept. He? Grim still had plenty of tricks up his sleeves. Chapter 410 The Ferocious Horde Three days later. The area surrounding Plaguewood had turned into a sea of beasts. The ground trembled, and the woods howled. Countless iron rhinoceroses, razor boars, leopards, and pythons emerged from the depths of the forest. Their numbers swelled and flooded the land like an unstoppable tsunami. Behind them, packs of wolves, lions, and tigers roared and sprinted on the ground. Apes and baboons swung from tree to tree, letting out loud shouts as they did so. From the skies, one could see countless beasts trampling across the mountainous terrain roaring, and even fighting amongst themselves. Surging black dots blanketed the entire forest. Lions, tigers, oxen, bears, boars, leopards, giant lizards, serpents, and even bats and owls were in the mix. Every single one of them was hastening towards Plaguewood with all they had. The magical creature lords had driven all the animals under their rule out of their dens. Every single beast headed towards the adepts. They picked up even more ordinary woodland beasts along the way. By the time they reached Plaguewood, their party had turned into a small-scale stampede. The manticores that used to rule Plaguewood didn't show themselves. The rioting beasts quickly entered the cave and headed straight for the underground through the dark tunnels. The bats that lived in the cave were caught by surprise. They flapped their wings and took to the skies, lingering there like an ominous black cloud. 
However, with the arrival of powerful flying creatures, the reluctant bats promptly abandoned their home and dispersed into the surrounding woods. A magic I created from concentrated fire elementium observed everything from high in the air. It was trying its best to focus on the few enormous magical creatures among the beasts. A dozen magical creature lords stood tall upon some boulders in front of the cave. They continuously commanded and drove the beasts into the underground cavern. The stealthy magic I slowly swept past the magical creature lords. Inside the Adept's Tower, Grim and Gargamel discreetly examined these invaders through a connected mirror. Unguja, the three-headed demon hound was standing atop a boulder. He let out a strange howl when he opened his fearsome maw. Fourteen drooling and sniffing fiend hounds stood before him, they acted as temporary supervisors for the horde, continually growling and driving the beasts forward. There was Dana, the terrifying Medusa who possessed the appearance of a beauty, a long snake's tail, and snakes for hair. Elegant purple and black scales filled her lower half's snake body. She had the beautiful face of a human woman. A thin layer of green scales only covered her four-meter-long body and naked torso beneath her chest. Dana's bountiful bosom swayed with every action she took. It was an alluring sight. She carried a strange longbow on her back that seemed to be a powerful magical weapon. She tried to stand on her tail as upright as she could, making herself seem more massive and intimidating than the other magical creatures around her. Seven hissing gorgons holding short boughs in their hands gathered in front of her. They didn't look much different from a medusa other than the much duller color of their scales. Only two of the seven gorgons had reached a depth level. The other five were all somewhere between pseudo-adept and advanced apprentice level. A dozen muscular minotaurs surrounded the gorgons. They looked like towering humans with the heads of bulls. The minotaurs were approximately two meters tall when they stood straight. They weighed over 320 kilograms, with hair all over their bodies and a giant pair of horns on their heads. Their arms were the same as a human's, five fingers on a hand, opposable thumbs, with claws where their nails should be. Their feet had the same hooves as cows. The minotaurs wore metal rings in their noses. Their every breath caused their nose ring to vibrate and clatter. Their angry, bloodshot eyes swept across the horde. Foot-long scars were not uncommon among these fearsome creatures. They held large axes in their hands as if they were ready to lunge at any moment. These minotaurs were clearly the low-level magical creatures serving under the Medusa. They were loyally standing guard around the gorgons, cautiously looking out for any enemies that might come too close. Apart from these impressive magical creature lords, there was also the giant berserk Gelada Cracklefang, the Wyvern Kingrak, and the Etikap Gori. These strange creatures gathered near the entrance of the cave like the monster's encyclopedia come to life. They silently awaited the main character of today's battle. They didn't wait long. Once the vast horde of beasts had entered the cave, a flood of terrifying spiderites emerged from the black forest. Their numbers were shocking as they swallowed the entire field of vision of anyone looking at the place. The spiderites were the size of a fist. The creatures had hairy bodies with purple stripes, four pairs of slim spider legs, and a rounded abdomen. Tula's gigantic body slowly appeared before everyone, escorted by his spiderites. Now that everyone is here, let the battle begin. Tula's mental voice rang out in the minds of the magical creature lords, I cannot wait to taste the sweet flesh of human adepts. Wake up, my children. The number of spiders in the forest exponentially increased as Tula gave this order. Countless spiders of all species and sizes flooded out of nowhere, instantly drowning some more unfortunate beasts that had yet to enter the cave with their numbers. Chittering sounds and the strange sound of biting and tearing came out from within the sea of spiders. The silhouettes of the beasts disappeared. Only a small hill of spiders was visible. When the hill finally dispersed and the spiders left, a pile of white bones was all that remained. 
No magical creature lords dared raise any objections that they had to these incidents of friendly fire. They could only manage their subordinates and keep them out of the way of the spider army. Tula the demon hunting spider and veteran lord present did not seem to betray any expression on its face. It extended its sturdy legs and left deep marks on the rock walls of the cave. Come, it is about time we enter. The magical creature lords followed behind the spider army under Tula's lead and slowly entered the bat cave. 